Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Micah Jackson, and I'm the president of Bexley Seabury Seminary. And it is my great joy to be with you all uh, today to talk about a really important topic in the lives of people who are struggling with how to live in this pandemic situation. You know, our prayer lives are important all the time but partly because of the solitude that we've been experiencing and partly because of the fact that our usual patterns of prayer have been disrupted by the need to stay home, to become physically distant from each other. People have begun to develop new ways of thinking about what it means to pray in the time of pandemic and what it means to have a life of prayer during this kind of time. So on behalf of our hosts, the SEEP Network, Bexley Seabury Seminary, and the Anglican Theological Review, I thank you, all of you, for attending this, and also uh, to our presenters for coming to join us this morning. We've got four excellent theologians and theological educators with us to help us begin to think about what it means to pray in the time of pandemic. I'm going to introduce them all briefly, then I'll give everyone a chance to speak. They'll speak for, well, I don't know, maybe about 10 minutes apiece, and then we'll have a time for questions. So as these questions come into your mind, please put them into the chat. You can direct the chat to uh, all of the panelists, and we'll be able to follow along with those and answer those questions that are on your minds about this topic of prayer and pandemic. With us this morning, is uh, with us today are Liza Anderson, who teaches theology at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota. Julia Gatta, pastoral theologian at the School of Theology at the University of South Sewanee. Jacob Sherman, who teaches philosophy, theology, and religious studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And Catherine Sondrager, a theologian at Virginia Theological Seminary. So, Let's start with hearing some of uh, our theologians' thoughts. Liza, what are you thinking? Thank you. So I'd like to focus my remarks this afternoon on the theological and spiritual implications of solitude. And in doing so, I am not at all assuming that solitude is an accurate description of how this particular chapter of life has looked for many of you, some of whom are no doubt thinking right now that some unremitting solitude sounds positively idyllic. But solitude has been my own experience, and it's been one that I've found surprisingly absent from the church's reflection. Instead, I've been positively inundated with helpful resources about how to appropriately pray together as a Christian family, while spending more time with the people who matter most. Sometimes these resources seem to harken back to a Reformation era notion of the household as a kind of monastery in miniature. Sometimes they evoke the early Christian tradition of house churches, often with a faulty assumption that those had anything to do with worship as a nuclear family. But they share an assumption that the basic unit of the church is really the family, that the family is the church in microcosm. So those of us who live alone, which is nearly 30% of American households, rarely seem to feature, or else there's some kind of well-intentioned but awkward attempt to force single people into forms of spiritual and liturgical life that were really designed for groups, such as the widespread but very questionable suggestion that we should wash our own feet on Maundy Thursday. In a world beset by a different kind of disaster, maybe those of us who don't live as part of a family would have been grafted onto the families of others. You know, if we'd had more time to prepare for this, I could be living my dream life right now, homeschooling other people's children. I would have made an awesome eccentric governess. But social and physical distancing preclude this. It seems, therefore, that those of us who find ourselves quite isolated might be better served by adopting forms of spiritual practice that were designed for those living in solitude in the first place, rather than by trying to adapt practices that were really intended for families or groups. Now, in a superficial sense, there's a wealth of parallel situations in the Christian tradition to draw on for wisdom and insight. Although monastic life and community has always been more popular, there's certainly a rich and diverse Christian tradition of solitary life. 
my own spirituality has been profoundly shaped by the desert fathers and mothers. And so those were the first writings that I instinctively turned to. Evagrius is the one true love of my life, despite the, despite the fact that he's celibate and dead, which are minor impediments. So, you know, I went straight for my Evagrius and straight for my desert fathers. But the truth is that for all of their praise of solitude, the texts themselves actually seem to reveal a very tight knit aromatical community. And they're primarily the records of conversations. So for a bunch of people supposedly spending all day alone in their cells, there seems to be a lot of talking going on in these texts. So I next turned to late medieval accounts of anchoresses. At first, this seemed to resonate really well with where I'm at. I am indeed shut up in a small apartment, mere feet from my parish church, during a time of plague and social disruption. But I quickly noticed with some suspicion that none of these medieval anchoresses ever seemed to talk about having to wash the dishes or prepare meals or sweep the floor. I did discover one 15th century Dutch forest hermit who complained about how hard her gardening was, but even that all turned out fine for her because Jesus shows up and tells her to go and rest while he does all of her housework. Despite my fervent hopes, this has not yet happened to me. So apparently, medieval anchoritic vocation generally came with benefactors who paid for everything and provided all of the food, and even servants who would handle all of the practical necessities like housework. So my 21st century imitation of that vocation seems to have some material deficiencies as well as some spiritual ones. But all of these different examples of solitary prayer in the Christian tradition still just didn't fully resonate. And I think it's for one very important reason. All of these traditions are about people who'd embraced a solitary spiritual life joyfully for reasons of vocation, not people who were forced into solitude as a kind of circumstantial necessity, whether or not it was spiritually the ideal thing for them. Indeed, most Christian monastic traditions have been, I think, appropriately wary of the solitary life acknowledging it as an important vocation for some, but stressing that people should be deeply formed in community first before attempting any such thing. And indeed, that perhaps most of us ideally should never attempt it at all. So it was to the medieval Syriac tradition that I turned and where I found perhaps the most helpful analog to our current situation. There, it was the tradition that novice monastics, whose primary vocation was to a communal life, would be sent off for seven weeks of total solitude during their novitiate. The seventh century writer Dadisho Catrayo wrote a kind of survival guide for those about to undertake this endeavor. And I absolutely love it because he doesn't sugarcoat anything. He talks about the spiritual benefits that'll ultimately result, but he does not try to paint this as some kind of comfortable spiritual retreat with lots of alone time to relax and meditate and read. He tells the novices very frankly that mostly they're gonna be pretty miserable. They're going to be lonely, disoriented, and they're going to acutely miss the Eucharist and the corporate liturgy that they're going to be totally without for these seven weeks. He writes that it's necessary to taste the bitterness of solitude, to feel the languor of dejectedness, and to permit the tedium and isolation to assail one during this time. He discourages any attempt to use distractions to try to circumvent or cut short these feelings. And he urges the novices to simply endure the solitary exile, trusting both that grace will be found within the solitude, but also that the joy that will be felt upon their eventual return to community will be greater in proportion to whatever despair they experience during their temporary exile. Dadisho talks at length about the real pain of being separated from the Eucharist during these weeks and how to use that pain so that it's profitable. This is quite similar to Western Christian discussions about spiritual communion, but I personally find it a bit more helpful in terms of being more concrete. For me, the challenge of spiritual communion is that if I'm not very careful, it's very easy for that category of spiritual to slip over into the category of the imaginary. So I've often joked during these first few weeks of quarantine, that I have developed an admirably robust practice of spiritual writing. I have earnestly desired to write things. I have thought a great deal at very considerable length about all of the particular things that I will write. And I eagerly anticipate the day upon which I will finally sit down and literally write actual words upon an actual page. <laughs> 
And if I'm temporarily impeded from writing by constantly staring at news updates and horrified dismay, well, as long as my very sincere desire to write was there, it should obviously count, right? It does not count, of course. But the thing is that if I'm honest with myself, my kind of flippant label of that practice of spiritual writing and my deeply sincere practice of spiritual communion look a little bit too close for comfort sometimes. But Dadisha doesn't speak about spiritualizing communion. Instead, he talks about interiorizing the Eucharistic liturgy. So the heart becomes a kind of altar upon which the mind, acting as priest, offers up every thought and every petition to God. The Holy Spirit descends upon those thoughts and petitions and sanctifies them, consecrating them in a way, in a manner analogous to the bread and wine in the Eucharist. The cell becomes a kind of church in miniature, as the place where this interior liturgy is performed. An ordinary manual labor takes on a sacred character when it's done with intentionality and mindfulness as an expression of that interior liturgy. For Dadisho, like many Eastern Christian writers, the human vocation is inherently a priestly vocation. That is, it's the vocation to take material things and make them sacred through both labor and contemplation. Now, they didn't mean that lay people should be off celebrating our own sacraments. But they really did mean that something like sweeping the floor or washing your plate could be a priestly and even a Eucharistic act if it was done in union with that kind of interior Eucharistic liturgy celebrated in your heart. The visible Eucharistic worship of the church and the invisible Eucharistic worship of the heart are properly perfect mirrors of each other. But the novice monk's temporary exile from visible worship was intended to heighten that experience and allow him to fully interiorize the liturgy so that when he eventually returned to the visible Eucharistic assembly, he wouldn't be a passive recipient of what is happening, but rather one who had fully internalized and oriented his life around the Eucharist precisely through that agonizing period of absence from it. So in conclusion, it seems to me that this kind of temporary, unwanted, and often frankly unpleasant solitude has only superficial similarities with the kind of lifelong vocation to a solitary life. But precisely for that reason, it may be more applicable to our current context than the wisdom of the Anchoritic tradition, as many of us attempt to navigate an unchosen spiritual solitude that may actually be rather at odds with our own sense of vocation. Thank you. Thanks, Liza. Thank you for that. And I really appreciate that sense that uh, that the experience many of us are having of being separated from the Eucharist might have some spiritual benefits of its own if we can if we can uh, live into that as opposed to just sitting around complaining about it. So a wonderful insight. I want to catch up on that later. Uh, but first, I'd like to uh, call on our next presenter, Julia. Sure. Well, recently I've been returning to Frank Griswold's spiritual autobiography, Tracking Down the Holy Ghost for Spiritual Sustenance. Early in that work, Bishop Griswold tells a story about an elderly Russian monk living in exile with his community in Finland in the middle of the 20th century. A prominent Russian Orthodox theologian had come to visit this remote community, but before leaving, urgently asked this revered older monk, how can we find our way in life, Father? To which the old monk simply replied, the very circumstances of our lives will show us the way. In other words, it's not by seeking to escape from our situation, but by burrowing into it, by noticing the presence and leading of God in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, that we discover the grace of the moment. And we are given grace, that is the help companionship of God at each moment. It is our daily bread. Like manna, we cannot hoard it or a stockpile grace to make sure we'll have plenty for tomorrow. It is given in the shifting circumstances of our days. 
day by day. I'm aware that those of you viewing this symposium are no doubt experiencing this pandemic in a wide spectrum of circumstances. Some like myself continue to work, but now from home and enjoy a steady income stream and so are merely inconvenienced. Others at the opposite end of the spectrum may be suffering from the virus themselves or caring for those who do, perhaps in medical facilities under horrific and exhausting conditions. Many risk their health and lives each day, providing the rest of us with essential services. Some of us are lacerated by grief or stricken with anxiety as our economic platform collapses. Still others are riddled with fear about all these things. Some of us are profoundly lonely. Others of us have way too much togetherness. Yet whatever circumstances of ours may, they may be, I believe that God is present in them. And one way or another, the Holy Spirit is showing us the way as we live through them. The old Russian monk's word to his visitor echoes ancient wisdom about prayer. It must be real. We need to take where we are, where we really are, and not in some idealized situation or some imaginary better frame of mind, and turn our actual situation into prayer. So in prayer, grief becomes lament. Anxiety and fear and heartbreak for others become intercession. Loneliness becomes solitude, companioned with the ever-present Christ. The challenges of an overcrowded household turn into petition for patience and mutual forbearance. The Psalms give us plenty of examples of complaining and grousing about the unfairness of it all. What makes all these sentiments prayer is that we've finally stopped the incessant inner dialogue with ourselves and instead turned towards God. We speak, but we also listen. To listen a little better, I want to suggest two practices among the many possibilities for prayer that I've found helpful over the years and that I'm finding helpful right now. The first comes from the Jesuit or Ignatian tradition and consists basically of looking over the last 24 hours of your day. After asking for the light and guidance of the Holy Spirit, you scan the day, noticing what pops into your awareness. Small encounters, a chance phone call, this event or that, or just going about your routine. Then you ask yourself, what happened in those situations that drew me closer to God? That engendered some measure of gratitude or love, compassion or hope, faith or joy, or simple perseverance? What was going on inside of me at those times? You also ask yourself if anything occurred that had the opposite effect. What might have drawn me away from God, instilled resentment or despondency, irritation or self-pity? When did I come up against my own frailty and how did I respond to that revelation? With humility and penitence 
or something else. Ignatius Loyola wanted members of his community to engage in this examine, as it is called, for about 15 minutes each day. If you do it regularly, I think you'll find that by going over the day prayerfully in this way, making your everyday life the text for your meditation and the springboard for your prayer, you'll begin to notice many things that otherwise tend to wash over us in our hurry and bustle and preoccupation with getting things done. We begin to notice the presence of God in other people, in small acts of kindness and service, and the many pleasant occurrences that we're apt to take for granted. We also begin to notice that places of difficulty or stress of setbacks or sheer suffering, in those God was there too, bearing it with us and holding us up. This simple exercise can thus help instill a sense of gratitude and a deeper faith and love. As we practice it, we start to pass through the events of our day with a somewhat enhanced mindfulness, noticing grace, noticing God, the very circumstances of our lives show us the way. The other practice I'd like to recommend would undergird the exam and exercise and indeed provide a structure to our day and that's the daily office. Many people are rediscovering this treasure in our Anglican tradition, since a number of parishes are live streaming it now on Sundays in the absence of our Eucharistic gatherings. But the office is really for every day. It's called the daily office. And I believe it's most fruitful when prayed day in and day out. This is partly because the readings are arranged in course. That is, lessons from the Bible are consecutive, one chapter following upon another. You just don't get the sweep of the story unless you're picking up the thread each day. You need a book of common prayer and a Bible to pray the office. But there are also some online resources that offer the full office every day. If you're new to the office, I suggest starting with either morning or evening prayer or even the daily devotions in the prayer book since they're framed along similar lines. These days when many of us lack a clear structure to our hours, the office can provide a framework for ordering time and sanctifying time. And this is both psychologically and spiritually healthy. The office is not so much our personal prayer as the prayer of the church. So we're praying with the praying community even when we say it alone. We can pray it whether we feel inspired or not. And I've found it to be an anchor through dry and difficult periods in my life. Another advantage is that in subtle ways, the office changes mood with the liturgical seasons. So it helps connect us to the particular mystery of Christ that the church is celebrating at a given time. Right now in the Easter season, for example, there are lots of alleluias. And we say the joyful and profound Pascha Nostrum near the beginning of morning prayer. The Pascha Nostrum proclaims how we share in the victory of Christ over sin and death and even pandemic and deepening our union with Christ is what prayer is all about. <laughs> 
Thank you, Julia. And thank you for sharing those practices. Uh, we'll try to come back to them and, and uh, have some discussion about that and how they might get folded in uh, later on. Next, I'd like to call on, well, before I call on Jacob, I'd like to remind all of you out there, uh, again, thank you for being a part of our discussion. And I want you very much to be a part of our discussion. So as you're hearing our speakers speak, please feel free to put your comments, your questions into the chat. Uh, you can see it down there at the bottom in the center of your screen, it says chat. Uh, when you open up that little window, you'll be able to send comments uh, either to uh, all of the other attendees, if that's your wish, or to just the panelists. So I invite you to participate in that. And it's from those uh, chat questions that I'm gonna draw some of our discussion questions. So please do participate in that way. Uh, now let's hear from Jacob. Jacob, thank you. Thanks, Micah. And thanks, uh, Julia and Liza for those reflections earlier. Really, I've really enjoyed them both. Um, I wish I could say that the great pause of the last seven weeks or so had brought a new kind of contemplative awareness to my life. Uh, but by and large, I found my concentration, my attention, and my energies pulled in wildly different directions. And this despite the privilege of my situation. I'm sheltering in place with my family, including two young children, and I'm still employed, albeit teaching and meeting online, seemingly interminably, rather than in person. But the omnipresence of the news cycle, the extent of suffering, and the inescapable awareness of the crisis itself are deeply disorienting. Beyond this, there are more invisible challenges that I think also deserve to be named. Some of what I have in mind is this. Homes, at least my home, uh, homes are not quite what they used to be. They've become offices, schoolhouses, lecture halls, meeting rooms, gyms, cocktail lounges, digital shopping malls, and for some, infirmaries. In many of these cases, there's a demand that our homes become outposts of external decision-making bodies over which we have little say, but to which we are accountable, by which we may even be surveilled. And all of this compounds the sense of fragility and dislocation. Our homes remain what they were, but are now far more colonized by corporate powers, commercial, political, educational, that increasingly determine our rhythms and seek to shape our desires. None of that's really entirely new. It's been going on for decades, right? But it's suddenly radically more acute. We may shelter from the virus, and for good reason, but our homes provide less shelter than ever from these other invisible forces, even while our homes are prevented from functioning as living places of hospitality and welcome. I think this is why, for me, prayer, and especially the recitation of the daily office, has never felt more urgent. In order to try to explain why, I find myself returning especially to certain themes from Thomas Aquinas, who I've been thinking about a lot lately. In particular, St. Thomas's teachings on prayer and desire. According to Aquinas, the point of praying is to rouse devotion and, in a really arresting phrase, to interpret our desires before God, to bring our desires into the intentional presence of God. I think that's what he means. In the midst of forces that seek to reorder our desires for political, economic, or personal gain during this crisis, including the temptations we might feel to exalt our desires above the needs of others, Aquinas reminds me that prayer, the daily observance of the office, work to conform our affections to Christ. The most perfect prayer, of course, is that given by our Lord, which is said to contain all Christian prayer in its integral fullness, to shape our whole effective life, as Aquinas puts it at one point. He says this, since prayer interprets our desires as it were before God, then alone is it right to ask for something in our prayers when it is right that we should desire it. Now in the Lord's prayer, not only do we ask for all that we may rightly desire, but also in the order wherein we ought to desire them. So that this prayer not only teaches us to ask, but directs all our affections. Through prayer, we articulate our desires and we bring them to God. But through this process, our desires are formed and transformed as we are brought more fully into the pattern of God's life. And quoting Dionysius, the Areopagite, Aquinas says, we call upon, when we call upon God in our prayers, we unveil our minds in God's presence. 
in the prayerful human in the prayerful hermeneutics of desire in other words calling and unveiling coincide and both point to the intentional enactment of a posture of vulnerability receptivity and trust but you might ask how is this shaping of our desires by god different from the cultivation of desire by those external forces i described at the outset those forces that increasingly occupy our homes, or at least so it seems. Well, to begin with, God is not an item within the physical world, not an agent among all the other agents, but is rather the creator of all that is, the simple, self-subsistent, eternal, and necessary act of being itself, both the end of all desiring and the source and creator of all finite destinies. Because God is not one object among others, God's not an agent acting upon us from without. And so there's no question of competition between God's desires for us and our deepest desires in God. Moreover, God has shown his love for us supremely in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, which we celebrate during this season. This is why the Lord's Prayer begins as it does, because, as Aquinas puts it, confidence is excited in us chiefly by the consideration of his charity in our regard, whereby he wills our good. Wherefore, we say, our Father an extraordinary invocation with which we begin the Lord's Prayer. I think what Aquinas is getting at here is what John says in 1 John, for uh, we love because he first loved us. Because the one to whom we pray is love itself, we can unveil our desire before him, through which our desires are reoriented toward their highest end, the love of God and God's self, and the love of ourselves and our neighbors in God. And this brings me to a final thought that seems important in the time of social distancing, at least important for me to remember. Uh, in the midst of social distancing, economic hardship, and real suffering, we come to our prayer. And through prayer, our desires are transformed. But so too is the very shape of the praying self. In coming to see ourselves and the world as porous to God's grace, we come also to see the way in which we're linked not only to God, but to one another. I've already pointed to the way in which the practice of prayer unsettles any notion of competition between the one praying and the one to whom we pray. But this relativizing of our autonomy reshapes our relation not only to God, but to one another. When, for example, we ask for our daily bread, we're involved in an essentially communal and relational pedagogy of prayer. Aquinas notes two aspects of this. First, by asking for our daily bread. The one who prays recognizes the obligation not to infringe upon the dignity and integrity of others. I don't ask to have your daily bread. St. Thomas explains, nobody ought to eat bread by, obtained by stealing. They should eat bread that comes from their own labor. But the fruits of our labor, and this is so important, the fruits of our labor are not merely ours. They come as gifts. For all things come as gifts from the triune God, the maker of heaven and earth. And so Aquinas adds, the temporal boons which are given to us, our daily bread, because of our need, should be accepted in such a way that we share them with others. Prayer then, by teaching us to receive all things as gifts from the divine generosity, is bound up also with our generosity and the relationships this entails. It's by good works, Aquinas explains, among, among which almsgiving is preeminent, that the soul is prepared for prayer. Let us lift up our hearts with our hands to the Lord, Lamentations 3. And this happens when our good works are in harmony with our prayer. So the interpretation and shaping of our desire that takes place, for example, when closing the day with Compline or opening it with morning prayer, is not a matter of our souls alone, but of bodies and bread and alms. And it's completed when we refuse the fallen autarky of merely individual concerns and give ourselves to prayerful charity. That's at least some of what I feel like I've been learning during these last seven weeks as I keep returning to the prayer of the daily office and to the interpretation of my desire. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. That connection between desire and prayer, that we pray for what we desire, but then we learn to desire what we pray for. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful connection. I look forward to following up on that too.
Uh, finally, on our uh, presenters, and then we'll get to some uh, common discussion, I'd like to invite Catherine Sondreger to speak to us. Kate? This has been such a wonderful feast and gift to me hearing these presentations. And uh, I feel already the graces that have been given to me. I, I thought I might speak on uh, three, I hope, um, integrated, articulated topics in thinking about prayer in the midst of this great calamity. Um, to speak about prayer as lament, um, which uh, Julia has also raised already for us. To speak about prayer as a divine plumb line held up against our society, our world. Uh, I hear that in some of Jacob's um, presentation. Um, and then to uh, speak of um, prayer as a recognition of Christ's victory, um, victory in the midst of death. And these are our themes that I, I heard in, in Liza's presentation. So it, first, this element of lament. I, I think um, many of you may have had the, um, the experience that I've had, some of you, that um, we're often um, handed petitions. Um, I'm continuing to teach at the seminary. We have uh, lists of, of petitions that we include in the uh, morning office. And they seem so finished. They seem to be a, uh, a list of, of people and of um, specific worries and names uh, of um, a, a kind of um, inward looking and ordering of the world as we encounter it and as we hope it might be. Um, but I, uh, and I, these petitions are important but I, I want to uh, raise the possibility that the, uh, the deepest prayer that we might offer at this hour is the unfinished prayer. And that, as, as Julia says, is, is seen in the Psalms over and again in Israel's prayer. It, it's the, it's the uh, calling upon the Lord for the things that we, uh, we cannot endure, we, we cannot understand, um, we, we cannot find a way through. Um, the lament is one of the uh, deep resources that our tradition and Israel's tradition gives us of the unfinished work that we are in the middle of. Um, this, I, I think, gives voice to the, the brokenness, uh, not only of our own individual lives, but uh, of, this, of this globe, of this human family, as it meets a, a disease, a, a virus, um, a, a call upon resources that we do not know how to manage and we have not found the wisdom to meet. Uh, this, I think, is what we see in a different way in Romans 8. And this is a, a text that those of you who have read uh, Professor Sarah Coakley's work know is central to her the way in which the spirit is, is breath uh, interceding for us with these sighs and groans too deep for words. Um, I, I think of this pandemic as this struggle for breath. It's, 
it's the whole lungs of this earth um, uh, uh, crying out, attempting to breathe. Um, and in our lament, we, we join uh, in, that, um, in that deep struggle, that longing for breath, that is what um, people suffering from this virus live with and what those who have breathed their last um, die from. And all of this is joined to the spirit who intercedes with those breaths, those sighs, too deep for words. So that's, that's the first element of, of prayer I, I want to recommend is the, these, um, as, as Luther says, these empty hands that we bring before God uh, and this um, inarticulate cry. Uh, that element is important in, in our day, I think. And it is a particular kind of intercession. Uh, next, and I, I think this is connected with this particular kind of intercession of, of lament, I wanted to uh, think uh, a bit with you today about Amos's plumb line, uh, the plumb line that the Lord uh, drops down in front of the people of Israel. I think this uh, pandemic is a plumb line of this kind. Uh, and particularly in the United States, I, I think this is globally true, but is especially important for us uh, citizens in the United States to think about. Uh, that the Lord is, is present in, in consolation, in, in spirit, in intercessing, um, and present also in judgment. Uh, I, I think this is part of, of the significance of, of thinking about the providentia Dei, the providence of God over the course of this world. Uh, God governs and upholds and sustains the world but God also judges it. And uh, what we are seeing, I think, as this pandemic moves through the United States is this profound cleavage in class, and if we still should use this word, in race, uh, we, we have seen here, I'm, I'm in the wider district of Columbia area, we have seen here that the African American community has taken the brunt of the illnesses and of the deaths. Um, this seems to be true in New Orleans, in, in New York, uh, in my home state of Michigan, in Detroit, uh, it's true in Georgia, where it's, it's not so much cities as the rural areas that, that are suffering, because these are African-American communities that are far from hospitals. They are far from health care, from a steady work. Uh, we see also this plumb line drop down in the midst of uh, lives like mine. I'm, you see me here in my study. I, I am, um, at, as Jacob says, I, I'm just um, a little uh, yellow box, um, hour after hour, day after day. Um, having Zoom conversations and talking to students and making little videos. Um, this is, um, I, I hope, um, being faithful to my, um, my priestly vows and, and to my 
um, professorial files. Um, but this is a, a life of privilege that is built. I, I, um, it seems to me the plumb line is directly down through my life. It, it's built on the fact that others are stocking those grocery shelves. They're, um, they're the nurses and doctors in the hospitals. They're the lawn crews um, cutting grass. Um, they're the, the great army of the unemployed um, trying to pick up day laborers, trying to do anything, painting, um, house cleaning. Um, this is being exposed relentlessly by this pandemic. And I, I believe that the holy judgment of God is, is being um, broken open for us here. Uh, that we are to um, to listen, to hear, and to see this, and to change. I, the uh, final element that I I think is is part of this whole movement from lament through through judgment um, to uh, Christ's own personal victory it is to focus on uh, the way in which a Christ rising, uh, Karl Barth often says this, it, a Christ rising is the great nevertheless, the great counterstroke against all that is and that is falling away. Uh, it, uh, Christ's victory it is not uh, something that is immune from the world that we live in and face. It, it's not a, a kind of um, sealed event that takes place only in, in church proclamation or, or in our hearts. Of course, it, it takes place there, um, and we hope um, in time and the sacraments of the church, but but Christ's victory is injected into this world, this world that is so broken uh, by sin and by grief, by loss, and it, when we enter more deeply into that lament, it into that judgment is where we find the counterstroke, where we find a Christ's victory declared. It's, it's not denying it. It's not looking the other way. It's standing at the grave and saying, Alleluia. This, this is the, uh, the somber realism of, of Christ's victory. Um, and I, I think Easter takes on a particular power now when we read of, of um, bodies in mass graves, of, of the calamity in the hospitals in, in Italy, in New York, um, in um, nursing homes. Um, we, we see the hand of death, which is the hand that will touch us all. And in this, Christ is victor. He is the one who breaks that power and who reigns as the, the great nevertheless, the, the great um, other who in fact is the, the king, Christ the king. Uh, so I, I, I want to join those three themes of, of lament, of judgment, and of victory as um, theological um, motifs, as scriptural elements that we might bring to prayer in the time of pandemic. And thank you for including me on this wonderful panel. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you for those reflections, Kate, especially for reminding us all of the terrible consequences of inequality that our society is experiencing in this, in this pandemic. And, uh, and also that for that uh, strikingly, hauntingly beautiful image of this pandemic as being a struggle for breath and the way that the spirit can come into that and provide some breath for us. Thank you. Thanks again to all four of you. Uh, now I'd love to have some conversation amongst all of us and also with all of you out there who have come to join us. Uh, thank you for being here. Please participate by commenting or uh, putting a question into the chat there at the bottom in that little thing that says chat if you're not familiar with Zoom quite yet. Uh, if you open that window, you'll be able to send a comment or a question uh, to all of us or, or just to the panelists. Please do join in the conversation. Uh, the, the first question I want to have, we've got some great questions already in the, uh, in the chat, but I'd like to begin with this one that came to me as we were thinking about it, uh, as hearing all of you speak. Your, many of you talked about the fact that we are not all experiencing this pandemic in the same way. Some of us are shut up with our families and some of us are shut up by ourselves and some of us are, uh, would love to be shut up but are forced by profession or circumstances or economic reality to go out into the world day by day. Uh, given that we're all experiencing this so very differently, is there any kind of common experience that we're having? Is there, is there any hope for common prayer? in all of this. Feel free to just unmute yourselves, leave it off if you want to, and, and just have, uh, have some thoughts about common prayer. Julia. Well, we're all anxious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th th there isn't anyone who's not, who doesn't have this on their mind. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's almost like a global <laughs> common mind that we have. I mean, everybody, this is on everyone's mind right now and I think everyone's anxious so in different ways but not entirely different ways and I think one of the uh, you know spiritual challenges for us I mean among other things is of course to allow the concerns of others to penetrate our hearts to be um, in deep intercession for those whose situation is not ours, who may very well be suffering more than we are, or those who, you know, as several of us have mentioned, who are providing essential services for us so that we can continue in relative comfort even, um, or health. But certainly that is, um, I mean, that, that, I mean, but how, how does one transmute anxiety? It seems to me one turns anxiety into petition, one turns anxiety into intercession. Um, uh, you know, Liza spoke about the, the altar of the heart. Uh, made me think of George Herbert. I, I thought about George Herbert a lot through several of your um, presentations. Um, but that, that sense of the interior altar where, um, of course, in the Eucharist, everything is offered to God. I mean, all creation is present at the Eucharist. And we join our own little corner of it to that whole great chorus in union with the sacrifice of Christ as Christ offers himself to the Father to us. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, deeply, it's a deep act of oblation to, to be... Uh, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ to, to try to take as much of this pain in the world as we can into ourselves to offer it up uh, in, in, in an interior Eucharist. Uh, it's a very, very profound reflection. Thank you, Julia. Mm. I, I wonder if, um, if to it, what is in common is this, this longing to have some 
connection that, that is grounded perhaps in our common mortality. This is, this is exposing really how frail we are and how all, an elite like me is so utterly dependent on the people my society treats so shabbily. That's, that's part of my, my finitude, recog recognizing my mortality and finitude. And, and so maybe this desire to connect is, is in part a recognition of finitude and a, a defense against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, um, in addition to anxiety, uh, I, I think the sense of mortality seems to be common in the midst of the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that would be common all the time since it's one of the two things we're most certain about. Mm -hmm. um, right, but really is more certain than the former, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's, um, but it, we live in a, I, I think we live in a culture that's, you know, really practiced at denying death. And uh, I'd even say often our churches are very practiced at denying death. Um, but I think when I mentioned, um, a few of us mentioned the daily office. And, and I think one of the things that I've found really striking about praying in the office, especially Compline, uh, throughout this is how it draws our attention in prayer to the memory of our death and the deaths of those around us and on whose toil we depend. And, um, and I think that's, that's profoundly in continuity with the vast swath of the Christian tradition through the ages, uh, but somewhat discontinuous with a lot of the pieties that uh, a certain kind of American 20th, 21st century Christianity seems more comfortable with, so. I think also, you know, in some ways the situation is sort of apocalyptic in the very literal sense of the term of unveiling and that it's just unveiling divisions that were already there to begin with. And so the ways in which we're all experiencing this differently are ways in which people already experience the world differently, but we sometimes had the luxury of forgetting about that. I mean, you know, we already in theory knew that there were tremendous racial and social inequalities. We already knew we had a broken healthcare system. We knew that we exploited underpaid workers. Um, but this has, it's sort of unveiled all of those distinctions that really were always there. You know, I mean, even what I spoke about in terms of, um, it's a much lesser problem, but you know, the marginalization of single people within the church, that was already there too. I mean, my favorite story, um, a few weeks into attending a new parish, the, the ladies of the parish, deeply well-meaning, sort of cornered me en masse and said that they had noticed I wasn't bringing my husband or children to church with me. And they just wanted me to know that I didn't need to leave my children at home with my husband because we welcome children in the church. Um, you know, and it was just so revealing of people's assumptions. Um, and you only think of your snappy comebacks too late. I mean, I wish I would have said, oh, well, you know, my wife is a devotee of Malik, and so we don't think the children will be with us for long, but thanks for your concern. <laughs> um, you know, but it's um, um, Good so that much. didn't come to your mind right away, Liza, probably, yeah, I feel sure. Probably just as well. <laughs> um, you know, but, but basically, I feel like in some ways, the gift of all of this is that it's really laying bare all kinds of realities that already were the case, and which we just had... Um, the luxury of numbing ourselves to or not seeing. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Liza, I wanna follow up on, on your presentation because lots of the comments that we're getting are, uh, are, people are saying that this idea of interiorizing the Eucharist and the liturgy is really resonating with them. Uh, can you tell us a, 
again, the name of, of this theologian who's come up with this idea and also uh, a little bit about where we can learn more because I think you've created a bunch of new fans here today. Yeah, I'm <laughs> uh, one and, of them. And maybe follow up a little bit about uh, one commenter asks if there are some practices that you can recommend that might help someone uh, to begin to do this work of interiorizing the liturgy. Sure. So the particular author I was talking about didn't in any way invent this idea, actually. So um, the author in question is Dadisho Katraya. Um, Katraya is the region he was from, which is like the eastern coast of Arabia. Um, it is available in English translation, but unfortunately, it's a very early 20th century, quite archaic translation, which you're not going to find a lot of joy in reading, probably. But um, you know, this actually, this was pretty much a universal theme in most of Greek patristic and also Syriac patristic literature. So um, I actually, I wrote a very tedious in retrospect dissertation chapter where I literally traced this theme through like every Greek or Syriac writer who'd ever written anything about it. And I was looking back because I was like, oh, I bet I could turn that into an article. Um, I may write an article about that, but I will not inflict that chapter on anyone because it is um, thorough, but it is unbearably tedious because um, it really is like dozens and dozens of people wrote about this. And I just sort of stubborn graduate student, you know, went through and traced every single one of them one at a time for centuries. Um, so in some ways, the, the places I would start, um, Origin of Alexandria actually writes about this in his very famous little treatise on prayer. Um, and Maximus the Confessor and Pseudo Macarius, who are both um, authors in the Greek patristic tradition, write about this at length. Um, so in some ways, those may be easier starting points. Um, yeah, in terms of how to do it, the, the truth is I'm not sure if I know, but even for me, um, as I actually try to visualize that and think about my own daily work in a kind of Eucharistic sense, um, I have found it helpful. Because again, um, I mean, I have, in some ways, I'm tremendously on board with the whole idea of spiritual communion. But that entire discourse as it developed in um, the early church and then really developed further by Thomas Aquinas, that was developed at a time when people thought of spiritual things as sort of like the most real, right? And so um, ideally one would have both physical communion and spiritual communion at the same time, but in the absence of one or the other, it was the spiritual that was the most real thing. Um, and I feel like for most of us, spiritual probably seems less real. I think it probably seems imaginary. And I wish that weren't the case. Um, I, um, you know, but I, I feel that um, for me, it, it has been less helpful because it's, it's easier to get sort of trapped in the, um, just sort of an imaginary thing. And thinking about, um, you know, what would it mean if like really concrete physical things like sweeping my floor, which I haven't done in a very long time, um, you know, like, could I think of that as, um, as a kind of Eucharistic act in the sense that it is taking something ordinary and material and um, making it sacred by doing it in a mindful or contemplative way? Um, anyone who knows anything about my housekeeping skills, which are gravely deficient, is probably listening to this and realizing that this is maybe more aspirational than something I have fully embodied. Um, but for me, at least, it's been um, maybe helpful in terms of making things more concrete. I, I would just, um, I could offer an example of this kind of interiorized Eucharist um, from someone a bit closer to our time, and that's uh, Teilhard de Chardin's um, Mass on the World, um, written in 1923, when, on, on the Feast of the Transfiguration, when he was on the steps of China and without any of the elements to celebrate the Eucharist. And it's a, it's a, short, it's a short piece. You'll find it in Hymn of the Universe. It's about 15 pages long. But he goes through step by step, and it would make, I think it's a good example of an interiorized sense 
deeply compassionate for the suffering of the world, say in the, in the offertory part as he meditates on what is being going to be offered this day to God and, and takes you through the step of offering and, 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 and transformation and communion and so forth. It, it's, uh, it's quite a beautiful meditation in itself and could provide, I think, an example of, of what you're speaking about in a, in a very contemporary voice. Certainly, someone who is a scientist and paleontologist is very uh, deeply rooted in, in the material. Um. Yeah, thank you. Kate, some of our commenters want to follow up on your idea of, uh, of the plumb line. And they're, they're asking about this idea about God's judgment. And how should we think about that idea of of the plumb line and God's judgment coming in part of this pandemic uh, without thinking that it means that God's judgment is falling unevenly on uh, the marginalized and people who are actually experiencing uh, this disease directly and, and even experiencing the bulk of the deaths. Can you say something about, about that? Yeah, that's such a, a good and important uh, question, and I, I thought um, Liza touched on that um, beautifully in her um, reference to uh, apocalyptic unveiling. It, it's so easy for us, I think, when we talk about divine judgment, um, to imagine that uh, what the, the doctrine is about is is seeing um, it, God visiting punishment on particular people, um, usually on other people, but, but not always. Uh, uh, Soren Kierkegaard's father uh, famously considered himself damned and, so, and thought his whole life was, was God's judgment on him. I, I think this is... Um, it's a very natural way to think about divine judgment because this is the way we as human beings think about judgment. We, we think of uh, someone being um, uh, brought to a sentencing and a, and a trial and a, um, some kind of prison sentence or restitution. But I, I think most properly what God's judgment is is this um, opening the eyes of our faith that this is what we see in um, in the Lucan narrative and what we see in apocalypse as Liza was saying in the root meaning of that term it's a it's this disclosing of what is actually true in our society so uh, uh, what the plumb line um, establishes in in Amos's prophetic work is is not a, a particular um, punishment that's being um, visited on a specific people as it is a, a measuring line against which we see everything else is crooked and a slant and that's that's what i think um of god's judgment it, his holiness is disclosing to us is the way in which the long-standing inequalities the the injustice of our society is being laid bare we, we can't um blind ourselves to it. Um, I, I pray that we cannot. Um, and this is, I think, a, a different matter than saying um, uh, God is, is visiting some kind of um, penalty on particular people, particular victims. Yeah, thanks for following up on that. We've got just a few minutes left. And um, uh, one of the questions that, that came up in the chat is I think a really good one for people when we think about uh, prayer in general. And it's just this question, in, 
how do we avoid thinking of prayer as kind of a kind of magic or treating God like a vending machine that if enough people pray or if we pray uh, fervently enough for a vaccine, then God will answer with a vaccine uh, or or anything else like that. You know, these kinds of things are really uh, shaking loose a lot of difficult ideas and, and real faith crises about uh, healing and cure and, and vaccines and justice and all of these things. What, what can we do in our prayer to turn away from that kind of magical thinking towards something that's more spiritually meaningful or, uh, or is that even possible? Well, prayer doesn't begin with us. You know, it, be it begins with God. Um, as, as Catherine was saying, it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's the Spirit praying within us that begins the whole process of prayer. When, when we think about praying, we're actually responding to something that's already happening. Um, we're not initiating it. The epistle to the Hebrew says that Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. So surely when we present our intercessions before God, we're actually going to the place where Christ is already praying for us. Again, we're not starting it. We're being invited by the Lord to share in Christ's own prayer uh, of intercession. Of course, you know, we start with the things that are on our hearts. You know, they may be worthy or not. Um, again, I'm reminded of poetry. You know, Julian of Norwich says that God is the uh, ground of our beseeching. And then T.S. Eliot picks that up in Four Quartets and changes it just a little bit. And he says that he speaks of the purification of our motive in the ground of our beseeching. So as we pray, our motives are getting sifted and sorted, coming under judgment and uh, purified uh, if we stay if we stay with it. So it's not a matter of, of uh, trying to change God's mind, but rather we're invited to participate in something Christ is already doing and is effective because we're united to each other in the very strong spiritual force field we call the communion of saints. I think I just want to add to that um, two quick thoughts. Uh, one is, um, one, one, from, one from Aquinas again, and another one from uh, 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 the writer Owen Barfield. Um, uh, Aquinas, th Aquinas takes this question on quite directly in his long article on prayer uh, and effectively says, uh, don't confuse, just because things are accomplished by prayer doesn't mean that they change God. Uh, because God is at the root, as Julia was saying, of our prayer. It's, if, if we were to think otherwise, it would actually be, you know, it would get us into a lot of real difficult spiritual tangles where we'd be thinking that prayer, you know, if God, God is the, 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 the primary cause and, and the creator of all that is, but prayer in the place where I, I, I ask God for things would be the one place where God's not, as if my will there were the one place where God's will were not active. Uh, and it's, it's pretty much the opposite as far as I understand it, uh, that, that what's happening in prayer and the interpretation of, of, de of our desire to ourselves is the recognition that, the that, that in, in that place where I express and even ask for things that I, I most desire, I learn to recognize that where it's most God, it's also most my own, right? It's not that it's, it's not that God is, uh, somehow opposed to me. God, God is other than me. And this is the bit from Owen Barfield that I wanted to remember from his book, Saving the Appearances. Barfield says, if, um, if a person doesn't believe that God is uh, in some sense opposed to him or other than him, that person can't be said to have religion at all. But if a person thinks that God is other than him or her in the same way that someone else is other than him or her, uh, we've fallen into idolatry. That, that God is both in me, in the, in, you know, most in, most innermost in me, as Augustine says, and also most above me. And in prayer is the place where that, that sort of impossible dialectic uh, is, it, 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 we live into it most powerfully. So it's, so asking God, I think, I, I pray for, I pray for the healing of the world 
all the time and pray for a cure and pray for the protection of the people around me. Uh, and I don't think it's magic at all because it's, it's, I'm joining my prayer to the prayer that I hope Christ is praying in me and not that I'm just trying to change him anyway. That's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, remember in, in Freud, magical thinking is a, is a kind of, um, defense it's uh, uh, you you don't um, uh, step on the crack in the sidewalk um, and and break your mother's back this this um, magical thinking um, because it it on one hand um, protects you from doing a terrible thing to your mother but also because it disguises you um, from recognizing that actually you feel anger, rage toward the mother. I, I, and I think, so magical thinking in, in prayer, it would be both a, um, a, a thought that somehow we could control God and would have all of the metaphysical problems that Jacob outlined so well, it would also be an expression of our, our rage that God has not made right what we have asked for. Um, and I think this, um, the Psalms are, are a great cure for this kind of magical thinking because they are so direct in their, their lament and their, their plea, their angry cry. Um, uh, Psalm 44 is just filled with um, the belief that, that Israel has faithfully lived and called upon the Lord, and you have uh, led us as uh, sheep to the slaughter. Um, so there's, there's a depth that, that can be found, I think, even in magical thinking. Um, but the, the uh, the truest cure of all that, I think, is is the life of Christ, who, who um, by worldly standards, is not a success. Um, who has who has failure and rejection and scorn as his lot. Um, this is showing us something about the the way of the creature and the way of God. Um, and the, the idea that, that God right and the, um, uh, all of our requests filled as we would like them it is the, uh, the counter narrative to the, the uh, whole uh, experience of our Lord in his movement from Bethlehem to Golgotha. I think maybe the the one thing I would add to the the very very good remarks that have already been made is that um, you know most of these these authors who write about a kind of interior liturgy talk about the fact that all of our thoughts and all of our prayers are a mixture of the good and bad. But the idea is that all of those are offered and in a way sacrificed on the altar of the heart. And so in a certain sense. Um, you know, by offering up every thought and every desire to God, what you're not doing is asking that they be fulfilled. What you're doing them is offering them as a sacrifice and turning them over to God. Um, and um, Dadisha, he's actually pretty harsh about this. I mean, he talks about the fact that um, many of those um, thoughts and many of those petitions that we offer to God, um, they're going to just be burned up with fire and destroyed because they were bad. Um, but that that's still um, exactly what you're supposed to be doing um, when those thoughts or desires occur to you. Um, because we don't actually know what the good ones and the bad ones are, right? I mean, like some seem more clear than others um, in terms of our, our prayers for other people and our world probably on the good side. Um, but, you know, like he especially would say the idea is that you offer every thought and every desire to God and allow God to then shape those 
as God wills without assuming that that will be by answering them necessarily. Romans 12, one through two. What an extraordinary conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you all of you. Uh, thank you, Kate and Jacob and Julia and Liza. Thanks to all of you who were present here to be a part of this conversation. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Jason Fout who put together this panel on behalf of the Anglican Theological Review and Bexley Seabury Seminary. And also Joe Swimmer uh, and the SEEP Network for, for hosting us today. Uh, thank you, thank you all very, very much for being a part of this. Uh, I look forward to our next conversation. And please be aware that this is being recorded and that these recordings will be available on the SEEP Network's, uh, SEEP Network's webpage where they've collected a lot of these kind of symposia and, and webinars. It's an extraordinary breadth of thinking on the part of the church about our response to this pandemic crisis. So thank you and uh, God be with you all. Thank you.